the two most important scriptures in the Bible, I believe, are the following. Get your King James Bible and open it up to the first book of Thessalonians, chapter number four. And we're going to start in verse 15. This is what is commonly known as the rapture or the second coming. Let's read it and then we'll analyze it. Paul writes, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I don't care what church you go to, virtually every single one will say, yep, this is the second coming. So let's break this down real quick. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now, when it's talking about, you know, preventing them which are asleep, they're talking about those that are dead, okay? Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Um, so if the Lord's descending from heaven with a shout, that doesn't sound like a secret rapture, does it? With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Now, a trumpet makes a sound, and they call that a trump. Not Donald, by the way. And with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay? It says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first, before those people that are still alive. Okay, that's a very important point. Now, I want you to think about something. If the pre-trib rapture is true, like most churches teach, and Christ whisk everybody away up to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and during the seven years of the tribulation, people are dying here on the earth for their faith for Christ, you know, those that didn't accept Christ or those that didn't believe in the pre-trib rapture, as churches say, and they die, um, not only would they be missing this marriage supper of the Lamb, but G uh, Paul clearly writes that the dead in Christ will rise first before those that are alive in Christ, that never died for Christ, in Christ. How does that happen? How can the dead in Christ rise first when people are still dying for Christ? In the tribulation. Unless, of course, it happens at the end. 
then this verse could be fulfilled. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. It says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Well, if, if all the dead in Christ have to rise first, that means it has to happen at the end of the tribulation after the last person who's died for Christ has been killed before the Lord returns. You can't have all the dead rise in Christ before more people are being killed in Christ during the tribulation. You know, the wrath of the, of the dragon. Think about what I'm saying. Read this and then think about it. Okay? But the most important thing to remember is, in Matthew 24, Jesus warns that the false Christ would come before he would. He says, be not deceived, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. He says, you know, if they say he's in the secret chamber or if he's in the desert, don't believe it. And he says, as, you know, lightning lights, you know, it light, as lightning lights up the sky, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. I'm paraphrasing. Read Matthew 24 for yourself. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So, if, if, Somebody comes and claims to be Christ and we're not caught together in the air, in the clouds, to meet them. It's the false Messiah. Period. And just remember, the dead in Christ are going to rise before those who were alive do. The dead in Christ will rise first then those that are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. If you're not caught up to meet the Lord in the air, it's the false Messiah, period. Very important point. All right, let's take a look at Matthew 24 real quick. Verse 23. And as he, Jesus, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they're asking Jesus, what, what's going to be the sign of your coming and, and, and the end of the world? Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, in other words, take heed, pay attention. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that ye are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. Right there, the Bi Jesus is warning his children there would be shortages of food. Uh, maybe you should prepare, okay? And there shall be famines and pestilences, that's outbreaks of diseases, and earthquakes in diverse places. Diverse, that, that's where we get the word diverse, which means many. If you've ever heard of a diverse population, it means many different, you know, population of many different people. Verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Mm. Isn't the name of Jesus becoming hated? Oh, yeah. And then shall many be offended. Ooh. And shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Yeah. 
Charles Taze Russell, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Mary Eddie Baker, um, you know, what's her name, the SDA, Christian Science, the SDA, uh, what was, uh, I don't know, there's, there's a bunch of them. And because iniquity, which is sin, verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Isn't that funny? Jesus said we had to endure unto the end. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's take a look. All right, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Now, the abomination of desolation, um, many people say that was fulfilled in 70 AD when the Roman army invaded Jerusalem and um, entered the temple. And I wouldn't argue that, but if there's another temple built in Jerusalem, look out, people, because that could be the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy. All right, verse 17. Let him which is on that... Okay, so if there is another temple, and you see the abomination of desolation and by spoken of by Daniel, which I believe is going to be the man of sin proclaiming himself that he is Christ... Verse 16, then let him, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Hmm. Did you know we're supposed to, Jesus said we're supposed to pray that our flight not be in the winter nor on the Sabbath day. Isn't that interesting? For then shall be great tribulation, which is trouble, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Listen carefully. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it or not. In other words, when people tell you, Oh, here is Christ, uh, or Moshaya, as the Jews say, don't believe it. Verse 24, Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. In other words, when they say Christ is in the desert, don't go there. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, Believe it not. Don't believe it, people. Listen to this. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, lightning, okay, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When Christ comes, it's going to be lightning in the sky, you know, light up the whole sky, the coming in the clouds. We're going to be caught up together with him in the clouds. And if we're not caught up 
in the clouds. It's the wrong Christ, the wrong Messiah. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the star shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. The first part of that is a um, paraphrase of the book of Joel. And then the um, last part is from the book of Revelation. Verse 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hmm. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Where's the pre-trib rapture here? I don't see it. You know? I don't see it. And, you know, it talks about um, as it was in the days of Noah. And, you know, two are going to be in the field, one taken, one left. Two women grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. As it was in the days of Noah? Well, yeah, but in the days of Noah, when Noah went into the ark and the flood came, uh, who was taken? The wicked were taken. And who was left? Noah was left. Isn't that the truth? Pre-trippers always tell you, oh, it's the righteous that are taken. Uh, no, in the days of Noah... Noah was left behind, and the wicked were the ones taken away in the flood. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. So, you know, if you're not taken to be caught up together with the Lord in the air, in the clouds, it's the false Messiah, people. Please remember that. Very very important. All right, so what's the next most important verse script of Scripture in the Bible? Turn to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Remember that, that great city. Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, you know, the mark of the beast, 666, Verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Wrath is anger. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. That means it's poured out full strength, industrial strength. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation. Do you know what indignation is? Extreme hatred. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, if there is ever 
a time when you got to take something in your right hand or in your forehead, I strongly recommend you believe this and don't take it. I know the pre-trib preachers will tell you, oh, well, you're not going to be here for this. But I tell you what, if there's ever comes a time that the world demands that you get a mark of some sort on your right hand or in your forehead, I suggest you turn it down. Now, I know there's people who say, well, you know, eternal security, once saved, always saved. Uh, the same shall... Uh, let, well, let's let's go back. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And you're going to argue, well, Lord, I yeah, I took the mark, but um, I have eternal security, once saved, always saved. And when he hands you a Bible and says, show me where it says eternal security, once saved, all saved, uh, good luck with that. Because he's, he's promising you right here, you take the mark, you worship the beast in his image, you will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, full strength in the cup of his indignation. And you will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And it says you're going to be tormented forever and ever. Uh, doesn't sound good, people. All right, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, uh, chapter 13, verse 15. And he, the beast and the false prophet, right? And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Okay? And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, just receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let he that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Six hundred and sixty-six. Six, six, six. You won't be able to buy or sell, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So if you don't have the number, or the name of the beast, you are not going to be able to buy or sell. So, if you're not caught up together in the clouds, to meet the Messiah, it's the wrong Messiah. And if the, this Messiah, or Christ, requires you to take some kind of a mark in your forehead or in your right hand, and you can't buy or sell without it, uh, if you take it, you're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever with fire and brimstone. And yes, I know. The churches that teach the pre-trib rapture, they they teach that, oh, well, you know, you're not going to be here for this. Well, like I say, if you're not caught up together with the Lord in the air, and another, well, Matthew 24 said that there'd be false Christs that would come first, and not to believe it. I'll tell you, people, read your Bible or you're going to be deceived. The devil has had at least 
almost well around 6,000 years and he's had almost 2,000 years since the days of Christ to think up some kind of a plan and I'll guarantee you it's gonna be a good plan it'll, it'll be a great plan and people who are ignorant of the Bible they're doomed they're pretty much doomed I mean they can be saved I have no doubt they can, but unless they know the scriptures or, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be deceived. Many people are going to be deceived. Jesus even said, be not deceived. Even the very elect, if it were possible, shall be deceived. Now, Let's take a look at what the Bible says about Jerusalem. Now, yes, I know that Jerusalem is the, we're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and it is the city of God. But let's look at the flip side. The Lord hasn't always been happy with Jerusalem. Let's take a look at some Bible verses about Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. How about Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 14? O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Jeremiah chapter 8, and verse 5. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast a seat. They refuse to return. Jeremiah thirteen twenty seven. I have seen thine adulteries, and thy names, and the lewdness of thy whoredom, and thine abominations on the hills, in the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 14. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem, an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Did you catch that? The Lord likened the, the people of Jerusalem as being like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jeremiah 44, verse 9. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Judah and the wickedness of their wives and your own wickedness and the wickedness of your wives which have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Lamentations, the book of Lamentations 1 and verse 8. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned. Therefore she is removed. All that honored her despised her, because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backwards. How about the book of Ezekiel? That's a wild book, huh? Son of man. Ezekiel 16, verse 2. Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Ooh. Malachi, chapter 2, and verse 11. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved and hath married the daughter of a strange god. How about Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8? 
This is talking about the two witnesses. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The great city they were talking about is Babylon in the context of Revelation 11. And it says that spiritually it's called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. I've heard people say, oh, well, Babylon, that's New York City. Well, that's part of it, yeah. I've heard others say Rome. Okay, that's part of it. I've heard Mecca. Okay, that's, you know, part of the Babylon system, yeah. But it says, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, I ask you a question. Was your Lord crucified in New York City? Was your Lord crucified in Rome, the Vatican? Was your Lord crucified in Mecca? I don't know about you, but my Lord is Jesus Christ, and he was crucified in Jerusalem which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. How about the words of Jesus in Matthew 23 and verse 37? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Jerusalem killed the prophets. Not New York City, not Mecca, not the Vatican, according to Jesus. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicken under her wings, and ye would not. Hmm. Okay. How about this thing? John 15 and verse 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. Huh, the Jews persecuted Jesus and tried to kill him? And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. John 7 and verse 1. After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Huh. Okay. How about Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, 15, and 16? For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things, of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost." In 1 Corinthians 16, 22, we read, If any man love not, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Anathema means cursed. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be cursed. Okay. So, Huh, that's interesting, right? So, speaking of Babylon, in Revelation 18, 12, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a giant millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and should be found no more at all. Verse 24, And in her was found the blood of prophets, and of saints, and, all that, and of all that were slain upon the earth. 
So Babylon was responsible for the blood of the prophets. Revelation 16, 6. For they have shed the blood of prophets, saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So Babylon killed the prophets. Jesus tells us who killed the prophets in Luke 13, 33. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of New York City? No. Uh, Vatican City? Rome? No. Mecca? No. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Jesus in Matthew 23, 37 again. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, hmm, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, together, even as a hen gathereth her chicken under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Revelation 11:8 again, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the of that of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem, people, right? And oh, by the way, Jerusalem is also built on seven hills. For those of you that don't know it. So, like I said, two most important scriptures in the Bible. If we're not caught up together in the air to meet the Lord, it's the wrong Christ. It's the wrong Messiah. And if you ever can't buy or sell except you have a mark on your right hand or in your forehead, I strongly recommend you ignore John MacArthur and don't take it. Period. So, what can I tell you? Well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God. And that's Jesus who is the Christ, who was slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.